thank you very much, Gary, for joining us here today. My um, pleasure. Uh, Gary, as we all know, is a Russian chess grandmaster, a former chess world champion. And I mean, you know, if there is somebody iconically, we look forward to anybody in chess, it's Gary. So thank you, uh, Gary, for making time and talking to us today here at Entrepreneur Media in India and Asia Pacific. You know, I'm sure you get this question asked a lot, but what was the age when you started competing in chess? You know, what, what was the first time you actually had the first uh, competitive uh, chess match? Uh, I'm always, you know, um, wary about the questions that have um, um, uh, indefinite terms like competing. You know, <laughs> okay. Because competing means what? You know, the games I played as, as a kid in the Pioneer Palace, yes, then probably age seven. Yeah, if you're talking about more, you know, serious events, then I would say nine or ten. But look, as 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 long as I remember myself, so I was playing chess, and and for me, playing was always, you know, uh, um, uh, competing until 2005, when I left professional chess. I still play game or two ex exhibitions, but I'm no longer competing. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Oh but yeah. From 1971 to 2005. I, I was, I had been competing. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the why I was asking you this question is that, you know, um, uh, the thing is that when we start early uh, doing something which is uh, more a competitive sport or anything which is in professional lines, do you think as a, I mean, and I'm asking you this as the editor of Entrepreneur, do you think it helps us to be more prepared to take on life's challenges instead of starting late. So do you have some theory for it in terms of starting early and what kind of competitive edge it gives you as a person uh, in terms of uh, being able to do things better and being able to manage challenges better in life? Yes, but uh, competing without starting and learning doesn't make much sense. So you could be very competitive, but ignorant. And uh, if you don't have tools to, um, to support your competitiveness, your eagerness to, to, to fight and win, uh, you will fail. So it's very important to actually to um, uh, combine these things. Yeah, I was competitive, I'm still competitive, but I knew that in order to advance myself and uh, to uh, play against stronger players and to climb at this you know, uh, chess ladder to the very top, I needed to study. So, uh, and um, I think that if we can, teach kids this combination, you study and then you compete, which means you invest your time in studying and then you, um, you apply in the knowledge that you accumulated through your studies into the competition. That definitely helps. Um, also, the game of chess is very helpful for any future engagements because it teaches kids to look at the big picture. It's not just the development of their cognitive skills, but it's also understanding the effect of, of your action uh, across the board. You can do something on the coin side, but then there could be you know, certain effect, the reciprocities on the other side of the board. And um, this, is, you know, this is something that I guess many kids are missing these days, also many adults. We try to compartmentalize things. We, we promote specialization while you know, um, uh, um, we ignore that's the, looking at the big picture, you know, one, the, one day or this you know, one minute a day just to forget about your specialization. I look, you know, I look to, to become a strategist. Yeah. So it's, it's very important. So, and, and definitely chess, chess is, is, is a good, is, uh, um, is a good teacher at early age uh, uh, that will, you know, help kids to be more, um, um, to, to have a broader view of, of any, any problem they're going to tackle. Sure. And I mean, you know, um, do you think the analytical skills that you've got from chess uh, is something uh, it sort of help you to naturally transition into the world of technology? It, it made those, those experiences, those analytical skills, they helped you to sort of understand technology and the whole, because technology itself is very complex. So do you think it helped you to understand the whole technology world better? Look, uh, I, I always say that even, you know, having a risk of, um, uh, raising anger among my former colleagues, 
I used to say that the aptitude for playing chess was nothing else than the aptitude for playing chess. But having said that, as I just you know, mentioned a few minutes ago, you always have a chance to transfer the knowledge from the game of chess, your analytical skills, your ability to uh, look at the game and to find your, your mistakes and to find improvements to other areas. And it's very important also to recognize what I call the limits of your ignorance. And I, you know, I'm, I'm a very proud man, but I don't know exactly where I should stop because my authority, my credibility, you know, just, you know, tells me, okay, that's the, that's the limit. Um, and uh, as for the world of technology, uh, while I'm not, uh, I'm not claiming to be an expert, a tech expert, but I understand the big picture. And I also um, had plenty of experience of competing with machines and working with machines. And I think I, I have enough, in, enough knowledge and credibility to tell the story of human machine relations from competing to collaborating. Right. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, it's in, in technology today, you need people who are just you know, doing this, this the hard work, you know, they come up with new ideas, new, uh, uh, new apps, uh, new um, tech concepts, but also you have to look at the big picture and to understand the trends. What are the patterns? Because the technology doesn't exist in the vacuum. Anything that is being developed immediately affects our lives. And that's where you know, I believe you know, my expertise, my analytical skills, my ability to compare different elements of the big picture, it com comes into play. And that's you know, how we built uh, our relations with Avast. So this is already the fourth year. And I wrote many, uh, many essays and blogs on privacy and security, AI, jobs. So those things that require also philosophical um, uh, um, uh, analysis and, uh, and understanding how how these you know, very complex relations between humans and technology will affect us today and tomorrow. And do you think with, particularly with the, the pandemic, I mean, digitization has become a way of life. Even if we were slow to adopt a lot of digital technologies, now we're absolutely on top of things in terms of doing or thinking digital and thinking of our businesses, how we can make them digital. And I mean, given the fact that you know, you've got such a, close relationship with Avast as a security ambassador for Avast. How is it that you see cybersecurity's role becoming more important? Because, you know, data is, of course, certainly one thing that is there. But more importantly, you know, children are studying online today. You see kids playing games online today. And then there are so many transactions we're doing online today. So whole cybersecurity's uh, need and I think uh, the premise has become much more important than what it was originally looked at. So how are you uh, uh, telling everybody that, you know, what they should know about cybersecurity? Uh, look, you just, you know, the, 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 your question actually contained an element of an answer because, <laughs> you know, these things are connected. You know, more digital technology comes into our lives, you know, more threats it, it is, it's we, we are facing. And um, we just should have to recognize simple thing that our, our, our technology, you know, makes us more... Um, uh, um, dependent on, on, on uh, um, these tools, which means they, they, we'll use many of them and, uh, and, uh, uh, and more, more we use them, more um, targets we create for, call them bad guys, you know, the wolves in the forest that are looking for, for, for easy prey. So that's why it's, the, it's, it's like in every, in every technology, it could be used for good or bad. Technology is agnostic, I always say. You know, you cannot say that it's, it's, it helps humans or hurts humans because it depends, you know, who is going to use it. So uh, I, I always, you know, tell people not to be concerned about evil AI because AI is not magic wand, uh, but it's not a terminator. It's, it's uh, um, um, again, it's, it's not uh, uh, a, a road to heaven, but also it's not, you know, gates of hell. Uh, it's, it's, it's what we should worry about. It's, um, it's, it's human human um, evil intentions, because humans still have monopoly for evil. Yeah. And uh, um, now, especially at the time of this, of this uh, crisis, uh, health crisis, pandemics, uh, more people actually shifted from protected environment at their workplace, because corporations heavily invested in, in building this, the, the all sorts of walls and, and protective systems into their less secure, sometimes totally defenseless home environment. 
And uh, I know just, you know, from many conferences that I visited with uh, as a representative of Abbas, that while people talk about uh, a lot about uh, cybersecurity, about, you know, the, their privacy, they are very, I mean, they're complacent, you know, and they, it's complacency almost at the level of negligence. Today, yeah. every, we know that we have to wash our hands. 20 seconds, you know, antibacterial soap, so this is, just do it carefully. But it's amazing that people just you know, pay little attention, if any, to what I call the uh, digital hygiene. So yeah. what, what about your device? You have your device, and this is the device contains so, so uh, um, many important items for your life. You know, it's so much precious information inside. And all you have to do is just to follow elementary rules, which does not mean you can prevent every intrusion. As you know, washing your hands doesn't, you know, uh, help you against against the virus. Not for me, but still, you know, 80, 90 percent of the threats can be eliminated if you follow the rules. But people talk a lot. But when you start asking them about the elementary things, wow, this is just it's amazing. But still, what is the most popular password in the world? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the <laughs> second one is one to nine. I mean, this is it's and and again, it's it's, it's even with technology that is, 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 is getting more friendly and, uh, and, and offering us opportunities to protect our environment, we pay almost no attention. Nobody reads, you know, manuals and corporations, they're not pressed enough to actually create simple manuals, you know, not 125 pages that nobody reads, but one or two pages about cybersecurity exclusively, especially at a time where people are always fascinated with these new, new apps you know, the appliances, uh, traditional appliances that have, uh, it's, that's, that's now become IoT. So this is the, uh, uh, all these, uh, the freezers, coffee machines, washing machines, and now they create smart homes. And the, 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 your smart home defense system depends on the weakest link. And most likely this is all these newest, newest devices built by the traditional uh, manufacturers who special, has been specializing for decades on building this washing machine or coffee machines, they, they, they are so weak. And again, it's that there are no standards to, to make sure that you know, people will recognize you know, how to avoid the wars. Because you know, if, if hacker gets in, uh, you know, your, into your smart home through a coffee machine, it has access to everything. We just, just to, to um, entertain the public, uh, uh, we had few uh, uh, events with, with a vast top hacker who happens to be also a Russian <laughs> yes. uh, hacker who just who's specializing on finding these ways of, of penetrating the systems. We did a few events on stage. It's the hacking the smart home, just telling people, you know, how easy it could be if, they, if, they, if they're complacent. So um, I think it's very important that people learn about it as, as a health crisis forced us to look at the medicine and the way we know we, we follow the elementary rules of hygiene. So the same, the same uh, um, vigilance must apply to our, uh, to our digital health. Sure. Yeah, I totally agree with you over there. And you know, I, I, uh, when I was sort of before this interview, I was reading about your work and you've always said that, you know, um, you've, you've been talking a lot about man against machine and you know that man and the machine need to corroborate with each other in order to be able to create a better society. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's very important that while we're learning how to sort of work more on machines to learn or to enable more digital, digitization in our uh, daily lives, it's also important that we understand that, you know, we need to be safe. We need safety from machines as well. We cannot be like uh, loosely um, trying to manage that. You know, which brings me to another question, Gary. And... Uh, uh, I know that you've always said that, you know, man will compete against the machine at some point of time. Um, and you've done it yourself, you know, with the deep, uh, the deep blue game that you've had. My point is, why does sport uh, sort of, and I think it's chess is probably the only one I see where man competes against a machine. I don't see it in other sports happening. Why, why is it important that we try to bring a culture of man trying to fight against a machine? Uh Look, you know, in the era of political correctness, as someone who lives in the United States, I always insist that we say human versus machine. Just, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it's, yeah, it started as man versus machine, but now it's, it's always human, and I think it's more precise. Yeah, so, um, uh, now, 
It's a, it's a very good question because it somehow, you know, reflects, um, you know, our psychology and the era of our interest. Because when you look at the relations between humans and machines, yeah, you can divide it in four phases. Phase one, it's just, you know, uh, it's forget about it. Machine cannot do that. It's just, yeah. it's the, it's, it's so primitive. Phase two, oh, machine can do that, but it's, it's weak. It's like a laughing stock. Phase three, oh, it's, it can do it and we can compete. Let's see who's stronger. Phase four, machine is better forever after. <laughs> now, right. when, you, when, you, when you look at this, at, this, at this timeline, phase three, the competition, is the, is the shortest one. It's like, you know, tiny dots in a history timeline. But that's what attracts us most. Though, you know, it's just, it's, I can tell you, in any game, you know, it's just, it goes through these four stages, and eventually, machine will always dominate. For a simple reason, because every year, whether it's chess, whether it's shogi Japanese chess, whether it's Go, whether it's uh, Texas Hold'em poker, whether it's uh, StarCraft or Dota, so video games. So whatever game you take, you can, you can describe it as a closed system. Closed system. And within a within closed system, machine will always prevail. Not because machine can calculate everything to the end. All, all these games, they are, you can call them mathematically infinite. So um, it's, it's technically probably incorrect, but it's the numbers in chess, for instance, 10 to the 46 power. That's good enough for us to call it infinite. But it's not about solving the game. It's about making fewer mistakes. And that's the, that's, it's a very important description that many people are missing. Machines beat us in these games, in the closed systems, not because they're perfect, but because they make fewer mistakes. Because we're human and we are just poised to make mistakes. Uh, and machines, you know, capitalize on it. They just don't make blunders. Yes, they're not perfect, perfect, but it's this, they're closer to perfection within the closed system. So uh, chess was one of the first examples to demonstrate so that eventually we will be, you know, lagging behind. And uh, while I was competing against machines and it was close, and uh, in, until probably 2003, 2004, there was still a competition. But now the, the difference in strengths between Magnus Carlsen, the current world champion, and the, uh, a strong uh, chest engine that you can buy and install on your laptop, like Stockfish or Houdini, uh, it's, it's the same as between Usain Bolt and Ferrari. Just, it, it, there's no more competition. Uh, yes. We saw it in Go, we saw it in other games, and people always get, oh, they, it's, it's fascinating. Look, machine beats humans here and there. No, it just, it's inevitable. So the strengths of the humans, and that we should recognize that it's time for us to shift the, par the paradigm from competition to collaboration. What we can bring into the human-machine collaboration, it's our intuition and our ability to actually to transcend, you know, just, you know, uh, over the closed system. We can transfer knowledge from one closed system to another, and machines cannot do that. Even when you have machine that, 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 that um, performs perfectly or nearly perfectly in, in StarCraft, the moment you change the map, you have to start from the scratch. So this is, so it's this, the minimal change in the rules forces machine to start reconsidering things, while humans immediately can see that its systems are, are, are very, 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 uh, um, close and almost almost similar so with with minor minor changes so it's very important for us again philosophically to recognize what is our role uh, uh in in human machine decision making process we yeah. have not we have we, we we have not to be too proud to compete with machines where they do better but we have to find whatever is left it could be the last few uh, de uh, um, uh decimal places but that's, that's how we can actually shift, you know, uh, 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 an, an angle of machines, massive brute force. So it's, it's, again, my experience helps to understand so how this, you know, how this cooperation could become very productive. And again, it's, 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 it's a very long story, but I think it's time for us, especially now at the uh, during this, uh, this pandemics, to understand that, you know, we, we should not stand we should not be standing on the way of 
incorporating machines and AI into, into, our, into our world, but we should actually, we have to speed it up because it's happening anyway. And when you look at the statistics, most of the jobs today, they require very, very little of human creativity because over the last two or three decades, we could proudly say, oh, this person, this man, this woman, they're working like machine. Now we have to go to the opposite direction. Now we have to celebrate our humanity, our creativity. So we have to find, you know, what are, what are the human, unique human qualities that could help us to, to add value to the machine decision-making process? Sure. No, I completely agree with you because I feel that, you know, eventually cooperation is only going to help us. I mean, eventually, I, I don't think we want to eradicate the human race as it is. Machines have to either help us or they have to replace us in some forms, but essentially uh, not complete with yeah, us. I just, yeah, the moment you said replace, you know, I'm, uh, I'm getting a bit, you know, uh, it's, it's, um, it sounds funny to me because it's the, you know, it's all based on these Hollywood fantasies. So it is the, only the, the Terminators, the Matrix. I mean, this is, this is the dystopian world that so far I see no reason why it's, it should happen, you know. Uh, I'm more concerned about us, you know, self-destructing. It's, and it's using machines. But again, it's not machines attacking us, but some crazy people, you know, with, the, with their crazy plans and, and, and evil intentions, they could use these machines to, to attack yeah. the rest of us and we'll fight back. And that's the real problem. So the problem in, is inside humanity. And, and I don't like us to, to shift, the, to shift the, uh, um, our attention to something that you know it's more of the more of the hollywood or bollywood or just you know this is this is not it's it's not even virtual reality it's it's more of our fantasies and our dystopian nightmares yeah no when i said uh, replace i mean essentially automation so in, maybe in some well, blue automation, you, know, you know it's the it's if machine does the job better than humans why not i mean it's the yeah. but so that's what, where, that's what where is what is easy. what is our role in these new relations, because maybe we have to start, we have to concentrate on just, you know, on expanding uh, our horizons, you know, we, we abandoned space exploration, deep ocean exploration. Maybe we should start taking more risk. I mean, just, you know, think, you know, about, about what human, human uh, um, genius can create. Uh, you know, in one of my uh, uh, um, uh, presentations, um, uh, it's, it was at Internet 50 event um, in uh, Los Angeles uh, when they celebrated the 50th anniversary of the first signal sent from UCLA to Stanford on October 29, 1969. I'm, I said that, you know, in 1969, the humanity celebrated the Apollo 11. So that was the big inspiration for a generation, for the whole world. Yeah, people got so excited. And in 2019, we celebrated iPhone 11. And this is, it's, it's not the same. And it's just, you know, people don't recognize that we, we reduced our creativity, our genius to building apps. Yeah, I'm happy to have a newest iPhone, though, okay, actually, I have a Samsung, so, but that's, it's under Android. <laughs> but it's just, we have separation family. I have Samsung, all my, you know, my, my wife and my, my daughter, they have, they have apples. <laughs> <laughs> just, we, we divided the world. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, you know, but it's, you know, but it's still, this, it's still technically, it's the same, you know, the same uh, device. It's getting better a little bit here and this camera is, 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 has better resolution, more memory. But at the end of the day, where are the breakthroughs? So yeah. this is, all 11 changed our world. And I believe today we can do more because this, we don't have, you know, we don't have to worry about, you know, the calculations as people 50 years ago. It's the, in your, you know, in your device that is in front of you, you have 10,000 times more, more power than the entire, you know, NASA computing uh, um, uh, structure in 1969. How do we use it? I don't think we use it very, very wisely. And, and don't tell me that with this kind of power, with this kind of access, we were no longer capable of, of moving the mountains. Sure. You know, I, uh, I was uh, listening to one of your earlier talks and also sort of uh, reading a bit of your book, which was on deep thinking, where machine learning ends and uh, human creativity begins. Um, so, you know, I came across two things, which 
but actually that if we want to use the best of technologies, we need to face our fears. So I would love for you to tell what are the real fears that you know, we as humans have and what we should face. And one thing that you mentioned in your speech was that life is really one person uh, calculate or any sort of competitive sport or anything that you, or even entrepreneurship for that matter is one person calculation and 99% intuition. So, you know, what intuitions today in pandemic times post that would you want to suggest to entrepreneurs? Look, you know, it's the, depends on your aspirations. So if you're real ambitious, you should understand that we all have access to the same information. So the difference between you and me or else or someone else of getting information is it's the, it's how soon you can swipe your finger or, or move your mouse or, you know, just, just scroll, scroll on the screen. We're talking about a second and maybe a split of a second. If you want to make a difference, you have to know where to stop and start using your brains. So making, you know, making your own um, um, uh, it's, it analysis and also uh, looking for patterns. So again, shift from machines, they uh, um, process data that is available to everybody now into, into the world of human intuition. Can you get wrong? Yes. But that means you have to take risk. And that's the, that's, I think that's one of the key problems we have been facing over the last uh, a few decades. We, we, we've grown complacent. We, we don't like risk. You know, now mitigating risk becomes now it's like a, a sort of, um, it's, it's, it's um, altar of worship for all businesses. No, we just, we have whole departments in big corporations analyzing how to reduce the risk. But if you reduce the risk, you know, you are also, you know, you're losing on your rewards. Now, unless you have access to, to, to uh, printing press and you can do, you know, and you can, you can start issuing money, you know, uh, in unlimited uh, uh, um, um, quantities as, as now central banks have been doing around the world. But if you are in business, so it's the, it's the risk and reward are connected. Uh, and, uh, um, and I think that we're just, you know, we, we just have to leave this vicious circle where we know we cannot go beyond next quarter because this is stock market now very much dominates the minds of big corporations or even mid-sized corporations. Anybody who is related to the market directly or indirectly through uh, your shareholders or through your investments. Uh, but the markets just, you know, with all due respect, they just, you know, they are very short horizon. Yes. And uh, one of the reasons now we don't have vaccines and it takes ages to create it because for nearly two decades, uh, big pharmaceutical companies kept cutting on R&D because any company that invested more in R&D uh, has been punished immediately on the market because market didn't like it. R&D, well, it it's, it's a waste of money. And, and by 2019, they all wrapped off their programs related to antibiotics or vaccines because they're not profitable. So you have to concentrate on, on long-term diseases like, you know, the cardiac, cardiac, uh, cardiac pro uh, um, uh, problems, yeah, and sure. diabetes, but, but this is the short term. It's too cheap. No, forget about it. And now look at the cost. Look at the price we're paying because, you know, we didn't want, want to, you know, to have emergency plans. So it's, this is, it's very important for us to get to recover the same spirit of innovations and risk. And also understanding that, you know, you need, you need, uh, uh, you know, um, this, you know, a strategic vision of the future that not necessarily based on, on the short term cal uh, uh, calculations. Um, right. And uh, uh, hopefully the crisis will actually force us to reconsider certain things that became pillars of modern economy. And, uh, and now they are just very much, you know, uh, uh, keeping us away from, from another breakthrough. It's like, you know, they these pillars suddenly become, you know, fetters. Yes, you know, that chain us, chain our creativity. Sure, and particularly, I mean, since you mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, healthcare being an important part, what particularly, I mean, on a, on a larger thought, what sort of uh, opportunities or what technologies do you see sort of uh, now emanating post the pandemic, which could be very interesting to look at and which would yeah. actually maybe build some mighty corporations out of it? Yeah, but it's the, first of all, you know, this is speaking about healthcare is that, you know, it's the, uh, I always, you know, I always confront those, you know, dystopian uh, 
uh, uh, prophets uh, who are talking about loss of jobs and it's there's so many you know uh, people that you know, uh, overqualified people you know the uh, in America or Europe they might be facing the challenges from machines and my answer is yes let's say you look at the some jobs in healthcare in radiology for instance and mm. yes I understand that machine AI AI intervention could actually you know could mm, could damage the uh, uh, the uh, the job market in the United States or in Europe yes. but the other side of the medal it brings down the cost Right. Which means more people can have access to 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 this service, not only in American Europe, but also in India, in, 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 in Africa, in Latin America. So if you look at us as humanity, human, you know, it's then we win as humanity. Yes, I understand, you know, that somebody is, is losing. I don't want to sound callous, but as a humanity, we win. And that's very important to understand that, you know, this is it's the it's. You, standing on the way of the progress, trying to preserve status quo, it's a lose-lose proposition. And uh, I don't even know w w where we can start now because, as I already mentioned, we have so much power in our hands now. We, it, all we need is just, you know, to accept certain risk. Because many corporations know that even new, new, uh, new medicine like antibiotics, you know, it's, um, uh, it will, will most likely fail uh, uh, current tests like FDA, FDA tests that were so rigid. Every every expert will tell you that penicillin today will be killed at the first at the first test because roughly every fifth person shows an allergy, and that's absolutely unacceptable. So some people say maybe Tylenol will not pass today the the the, 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 uh, the regulations that have been imposed. So I understand that you know you can you can you know have a risk and and and. You know, some people may not may not uh, um, do well with antibiotics, but as a humanity, we always win with these new ideas. And that's, by the way, one of the one of the arguments in favor of the space exploration, because if now here on Earth, uh, the corporations, the pharmaceutical companies, all the in, in, in inventors, they have to deal with with uh, with uh, you know impossible odds. You know, you need just you know. Uh, uh, if, Less than one one out of a thousand accidents for for you for you to pass the test. Uh, what then? The moment you have something as risky as flight to Mars, with chances of return 50-50. So you will look for new medicine, for new drugs, for your for new ways of doing oxygen. And 30% risk is already acceptable. So because it improves your odds. So it's this is this is for us again. It's for us as humans, as a humanity, to recognize we have a time where just we have to. Thanks to pandemics, by the way, we have to recognize that you know it's the uh, being cautious, being overprotective, doesn't save us from other threats because it can come from the wild nature, it can come from the lab because of the mistakes. Actually, I believe you know it was it was, it came from the lab this one, but it doesn't matter what, what what the origin. It's this the world includes so many elements, whether in wild nature or us working with that, so we cannot guarantee that another COVID will not hit us. And if we stop research, our research, if we stop, you know, uh, you know, the engine of innovation, the true innovation, not, you know, not a, an, another, you know, um, uh, uh, app for, for, for uh, uh, App Store, but just real breakthrough innovations. I think we'll, we'll be paying a price as we are paying now. Sure. I mean, since we're talking about technologies post pandemic and, you know, Education technology is something that has emerged in a big way because, you know, every, pretty much all schools had to look at online education as the way forward. Do you also feel, do you look at it as a big opportunity? I mean, particularly from Kasparov Foundation's perspective, are you already teaching and training children across the world in so many different countries about chess? Do you feel it's an opportunity for you to reach out to more kids uh, in more countries to actually help them learn chess and uh, be able to enable them better? Look, it's not, it's not just about chess. I think that's now education is also facing, uh, facing the big challenge. And I think it's good because education is the most outdated area of, of uh, our life today. If you make some kind of mental experiment and bring a person from mid 19th century to 2020, what this person will uh, will recognize because everything is different except the classroom 
the classroom yeah. is still the same. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have a teacher, you have kids. So it's, oh, wow, this is something is still, you know, still there, I can recognize. Uh, now, many schools, in, I, I don't know about India, but definitely in America, in, in many European countries, they shifted to, to distant learning. And I think in America, most likely, uh, schools will be closed until Christmas, or there will be some kind of, you know, shifting, you know, uh, um, they, they'll, they'll do shifts, uh, bringing some kids in, out, because they cannot have big, uh, full classes. But distant learning becomes a reality, which means, you know, I can have, you know, my kids here in Croatia, and they can learn from New York, or you can have, you know, your kids in India, and they can learn from uh, Australia. I mean, this is the, so, but it's, as I said, it's good because we need to understand that the, the whole concept of education, the way I was taught, I, I was taught, you were taught, it's totally, you know, it's antiquated today because the purpose of education is to prepare our kids for the future life. Now, I was sure we're preparing, preparing them for the future life. For, you know, most of the jobs that they will, they will covet 10, 15 years from now, I guess don't exist today. Yeah. So I think the fundamental problem of education is that we are still teaching them what instead of teaching them how. Because the, the purpose of the education and the role of a teacher was to be the source of knowledge and authority in the classroom because he or she knew so much more than the kids. Uh -huh. Today, you know, in, in, in a minute, the kid can actually swap his or her finger and they can just learn everything. So simply telling them, you know, oh, it happened then and there, why, what's the purpose? You know, you just, you just have to utilize this massive data that's available to them and it's more entertaining. These kids call them iPad generation, the Zoomers. They live, you know, uh, in the world which is interactive and education is still one way street. Yeah. And it just, it's so, it goes so much against the, the way they, 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 they see the world. And, and, you know, I have, I have four kids, but this, this is, that's from 27, uh, uh, 20, 23, girl turning 14 and little one is turning five in, in couple of, uh, in couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, so, and this is the, this was, was my wife. Now we have, the, we have our two kids, 14 and five. And, and, you know, I look at them. And I could see the difference, though they're nine years apart. Yeah. But it's just, you know, it's already, you know, this is these nine years, it already shows the difference. Though, of course, our 14 year old, she's far more advanced than my wife. Uh, and I'm not even mentioning myself. I'm a, I'm a boomer, you know, so I'm just, you know, I'm a dinosaur. So I, <laughs> I'm afraid of computers. <laughs> and I see that's how they quickly they operate. But when you look at the little one, I mean, he just, it's, he breathes, it's, it's like breathing for him. And, and this is the, the funny story we had lately that is he discovered somewhere, you know, just in our apartment, uh, my daughter's um, uh, um, DVDs. Because she was still watching cartoons on DVDs in just in 2009, 2010. And he didn't know what it is. He thought it was a Frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> because he wasn't sure. So what do you do with this? this is just, it's so... It's life changes so fast. And the, the whole story is the point of all whole, whole stories. We have to understand that we have to guide them. It's not so yeah. much about teaching. <coughs> uh, because they, you know, they, they, they could get very, they could get frustrated very, very quickly if we're telling them things that just they, they either they can find out or they don't believe they're relevant. Yeah, no, I agree with you and I think what is now required is more specialization for children. And in fact, the whole teaching quality to be made much better so that children can really grasp because finding information is very easy for them. But what information they'll find is that is more critical. Uh, actually, going back to the first question you asked about chess, it's, 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 it's about application. How to apply this information correctly? So what is the most effective way to utilize your knowledge? That's, what we sh that's the experience we can share. Because, yeah. you know, it's just, it's simply now just, you know, uh, uh, giving the, sharing the information we have with them, you know, just that again, doesn't make any sense. So they will, they find information quicker, but they still, you know, require our guidance to, to apply it, you know, uh, effectively in, in the correct spot. 
Sure. So one final question. I know I've taken a lot of your time, Gary, but you know, Absolutely. pandemic has made a lot of us uh, very wary right now. We don't know what the future is likely to be. We feel that uh, we don't know what is coming and it's not much, even businesses, even big ones, they can uh, seemingly forecast what they can expect in the year or maybe in the next year. So what would be your, you know, you've been through so many um, challenges yourself. Each game is a different challenge. You know, each preparing for each competition is a different challenge. So what would you tell young startups, young entrepreneurs out there to sort of keep going and stay afloat and, you know, let um, things happen or take their course? Look, we, you know, we, yeah, we are going through the crisis. Crisis is the biggest one, you know, in our lifetime. Uh, hopefully, so that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the biggest one. Um, but definitely, this 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 challenge showed how fragile was this system based on globalization, and and again, all the elements that we thought were pillars now are somehow just you know they are not not helping us to um, move move uh, um, safely into the future. Um, I think it's 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 all it's also a, a time. For, uh, for big and called risky decisions, because every crisis, it's also an opportunity. You know, it's crisis means changes. Changes affect big corporations and, and big institutions uh, 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 more profoundly than, than startups. Like, you know, when everything is collapsing, you know, this, the, it's a, a big dinosaur is, 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 is less likely to survive than, than uh, uh, a, a savvy, I don't know, it's, it's the uh, uh, cat that can just run around. So it's a, it's a chance. And uh, while yeah, and people, I understand they want to play safe, it's an opportunity to actually look for, for new entries because the, the world year two from now will be different. I don't believe for a moment that we return to the status quo. I don't know what will be the, the, the overall outcome. Uh, it's definitely will be less, there will be less flying, which is for me, it just, you know, sounds a bit odd because I've been flying for the last 45 years <laughs> of my life. Yeah, there will be, there will be less, you know, uh, live conferences, there will be more digital, but also there will be other things. And, uh, you know, it's the, I, I have tons of ideas, you know, floating in my head, but we have limited time to, to, to discuss it. But it's for these young startups actually to start looking for new entries because, there will be opportunities. Again, every crisis offers opportunity and, and that's a time for them to actually reshape the world. Because I think it's this, the, it's people are getting more and more hungry and hungry for individual powers. Like, you know, it's not accidental, the rise of Bitcoin and blockchain technology, because people want to control their privacy, their fortunes. That's where you have opportunities. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a never ending battle between control, and freedom, but you know we have we have a lot of opportunities. Stop complaining about Facebooks of this world, you know, having too much data, and the governments are spying on us. They yeah. will do it. I mean, that's the that's the rule. That's that's the name of the game. How yeah. about us using this technology to turn the table? 